complete our treatment of the classical wave equation by considering a higher dimensional uh, version of this, uh, something I call a vibrating membrane. So I want you to imagine that you have a coordinate space in X and Y, and that somehow you've attached a frame in this coordinate space uh, that runs from 0 to L sub X in the X direction and 0 to L sub Y in the Y direction and you create this rectangular frame and you stretch a membrane across it so a two-dimensional surface and that membrane now can vibrate relative to the plane of the page so it's kind of like a drum head if you will a drum head with a rectangular head now in order to treat this we're going to have solutions that will have the form that looks like this where they have a coordinate extent in both x and y and a time uh, component in t so what it means is that our overall classical wave equation now is going to look like this. We're going to have a component that is the second derivative with respect to x. We're going to have a term that is the second derivative with respect to y. And we'll have our typical time-dependent component with 1 over v squared and the second derivative with respect to time. So this is our full classical wave equation for this membrane. Now, how would we deal with this? Well, once again, we're going to use the separation of variables. And I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly because we've seen all of this before. Um, but if we write our overall solution of u, x, y, and t as equal to a product of a part that depends on x and y and a product and a part that depends upon t, um, then we can neatly separate this into an ordinary differential equation part and a linear partial differential equation part. Now, let me show you what the separation of variables will lead to. If we uh, plug this uh, expression for u of t, u of x, y, and t into this equ equation, then divide by the u of x, y, and t, what we'll end up getting is an equation that looks like this. We'll have 1 over v squared t of t times the second derivative of t with respect to t, little t, We'll then also get a linear partial differential equation part that looks like this, 1 over x of f of x and y times, now, the second derivative of f, and these are partial derivatives now, and the second derivative with respect to y. And that both of these, since they're equal to one another, um, means they can't change when you change the variables they depend upon. They must be equal to the same constant. Now, in this case, we're going to go ahead and let this constant be equal to minus k squared. So we're basically saying we're looking at a case when uh, our functions are going to be oscillating solutions, that our alpha is less than 0. All right, so for the ordinary differential equation, so I'll call that part 1, what we'll have is uh, a solution or an equation that we have to solve that looks something like this. And it'll be second derivative of t, v squared alpha, t of t. And we already know that this is going to lead to oscillatory solutions. We've solved for those solutions. So I'm just going to go straight to the result, which is basically that we could write t of t, and we'll again assume appropriate uh, starting conditions, initial conditions, so that we can simply write this as cosine of omega n t. All right, so it's some oscillating solution. I'm not going to say any more about the time-dependent part for this because I want to focus on the spatial part uh, for this particular setup. All right, now what about the other part? Well, I've got uh, essentially a linear dif partial differential equation that looks like this for this function f. And it's going to be equal to alpha, our constant, same constant here, times f of x and y. But now I've got another thing that I can use separation of variables. So I'm going to draw a line across here and say I'm going to write f of x and y as a product of a part that depends only on an x and a part that depends only on y. And this, in fact, is going to lead me to two new ordinary differential equations. And I'll put them in a little different color so that they stand out, where we'll have a second derivative with respect of big X with respect to little x equal and proportional to itself. Now, this thing that I'm going to put in here, and I'm not going to go through the argument, but uh, one can um, basically set it equal to a constant p squared, but it'll be a different constant 
for the same equation written in terms of y. And this I'll call q squared. But we have very similar equations here. What we do have is a relationship between these two that their sum has to be equal to k squared. All right, so, and remember this is equal to minus alpha. All right, so we'll have two different solutions here uh, for this linear partial differential equation. All right, so in effect what has happened is when we had a single dimension, when we had a vibrating string, we only had one of these as an ordinary differential equation. With a vibrating membrane, we end up with two of them. Okay, you can imagine if we had somehow an object that was three-dimensional and was vibrating or oscillating, um, that we would then have a third ordinary differential equation that we could get out of that, although that's a, a little bit more complicated case. All right, so let me go ahead and, and go straight to writing down a solution for this thing. Okay, a general solution for the x part might look something like this. Okay, it'll be C1, and it will be cosine of k1, well, not k, but p times x, plus c2 sine of p times x. But I know that if I impose boundary conditions in the x direction, going from 0 to lx, that in fact these p's could be written as a, a constant or an integer in sub x pi times x, uh, time pi over l sub x. So in fact, this will end up being something like c1 cosine nx pi x over l sub x plus c2 sine of nx pi x over l sub x. Okay, and by imposing those boundary conditions, this part will disappear. I'll end up with a part that's only got sine. So this will ultimately uh, devolve to sine of nx pi x over l sub x. Okay, I think it's easy to anticipate that the same will happen for the y coordinate. Uh, mathematically, it is same in every way. Okay, in this case, I'll, I'll call it d2 sine. Now I'll have a new uh, number, a new integer in y pi y over l sub y. All right, so my overall f of x, y is going to be the product of these two functions. So I'll have c2 d2 sine n x pi x over l sub x sine n y pi y l sub y. All right, so this is the part that would multiply the uh, time-dependent part, which is given up here, time-dependent part here. All right, so these two numbers that we've invoked, these two integers, n sub x and n sub y, both can take on values that run from 1 to 3 and so forth, but they don't have to be equal to one another. They can be different numbers. Now, in order to sort of illustrate what this means uh, functionally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some cartoons of this membrane, and I'm, what I'm going to try to do is reproduce the same rectangle several times as I uh, draw different states for this. And what I want to do on these different outlines is, since I can't draw an oscillating function very easily in two dimensions, I suppose you could with a computer, um, but I'm doing it by hand. Um, instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the nodal surfaces. Okay, and remember that we found that the number of nodes was equal to n minus 1 when we had a vibrating string. It's going to be the same thing now for each of the two coordinates uh, in the vibrating membrane. So let's say, first of all, we have a, a state that has a node that runs across like this. Okay, so this is a case where there is no node in the, NX, in the x direction, so nx is going to be equal to 1. But in y, there is a node, so ny is equal to 2. Okay, if I did uh, sort of the corresponding one with a node that runs right down the middle and the, separates the two sides of the x, I'll have nx equals 2 and ny is equal to 1. Okay, so you can see I have two different states here, um, both with these numbers equaling 1 and 2, but they're reversed, so it reverses the sense in which the node goes. What if I had one in each direction? 
Well, in this case, I'm going to divide my wave function into four regions, and both nx and ny are equal to 2 in this particular case. I can also create one that has nodes in the x direction but not in the y direction, but I have two nodes. So this would mean that nx is equal to 3 and y is equal to 1. Or I could take the same one and have a node in the y direction. So nx is equal to 3 and ny is equal to 2. All right, but you can get all kinds of different uh, wave functions this way simply by specifying where the nodes lie. Now I want to add one other feature to this picture, and that is to note that when I had a, a one-dimensional oscillating function, so I have an oscillation like this, um, it was easy to see the difference between the part that's up and the part that's down. I might label the part that's up as plus and the part that's down as minus. Since I can't easily draw that here, what I'm going to do is use plus and minus to indicate that here. Now, I will tell you it's arbitrary which one you make plus and which one you make minus because you could always multiply these functions by minus 1 and still get a valid solution. But I'm going to arbitrarily choose this one to be plus, so since I cross a node, this one must be minus. So if I were to look from the edge here, it would look like this function here, okay, where uh, this is the y direction in this case, and I'm looking down along the x-axis. Okay, what about the second one? Well, again, I might choose this one to be plus, so this one has to be minus, okay, again, oscillation in that two-dimensional uh, membrane. Okay, for the third one here, if this is plus, then I know this one has to be minus because I cross a node to get there, and this one has to be minus. But then both of these cross a node to get to this one, so that one has to be plus. All right, similarly here, if I start with plus on the left-hand side, then I have to go to a minus region, then back to a plus region. What about this more complicated one over here? Well, if I start with plus in the lower left, these two have to be minus then this one has to be plus and this one has to be plus because it's across the node from a minus region and this one has to be minus. So I think you can see that uh, with this particular simple kind of setup one can map out with nodes sort of where all of the uh, positive and negative oscillations are within this vibrating membrane wave function. All right now I mentioned uh, that uh, this is uh, like a drum. Like we, this could be a drum head. Well normally drums are round. So how would this look on a round surface? What if I had a round surface where all of the, the boundary condition was that the uh, membrane had to be held fixed at the edge of the circle? Well, we could still have nodes that go across and go up and down. But another thing that's interesting about this case is because it has radial symmetry, we can also have nodes that go around like that. All right, now I'm not going to worry you too much about thinking about this, but I wanted to show this to you because this is a little bit, uh, um, this is going to suggest something we'll see in the future. When we start talking about atoms, they have this same kind of symmetry. And so we're going to see the presence of nodes that run across like this, or up and down like this, and the presence of nodes that sort of circle like this. And uh, it's going to make a difference in terms of the wave functions that they create. So in fact, uh, this vibrating membrane may not seem very much like an atom, but it begins to tell us something that we'll need to know later on when we start talking about atoms more seriously.